All right, everyone. Welcome to incorporating sustainable practices into the plastic culture strawberry production. My name is Amanda McWhort. I'm a PhD student here at NC State in the Department of Crop Science, and I work on strawberries as a part of my research. Um, I want to quickly go over the outline of what we're going to be talking about today um, and introduce our other two speakers. Uh, at the very beginning, I'm going to just go over what we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability and what that means for strawberry production. Um, then we're going to have Dr. Hannah Barak. She's an associate professor of, extension, of entomology and an extension specialist here at NC State. She's going to speak about integrated pest management practices, and we might actually have her speak last. Um, and then following that, we will have Dr. Michelle Schroeder Moreno. She is an associate prof professor of crop science here at NC State, and she's also the agroecology program coordinator for us. Um, and she's going to be talking about soil health and its importance and in incorporation into strawberry production. And I'm going to follow her and talk about soil management practices um, for strawberry production. Throughout these three presentations, we will be referring to a lot of other resources, um, websites, and books that are out there. Um, at the very end, we will have one slide with all of those links again. So if you missed one during the presentation, we'll have that for you again at the end. Um, and as well, we will have them linked um, on Hannah's website. So if you want to just go to her website, you can find all of those links as well. Um, we will be taking questions from the audience at the very end. So if you have a question at any point uh, during the presentation, go ahead and use the chat, which is down in the bottom left-hand corner. You can type in any of your questions there, and we'll be monitoring those. Um, and we will try and get to as many questions as we can at the end. Um, I'd like to point out if you're having trouble with your connection and the video is loading really slowly, you can go ahead and close the video box in the upper left-hand corner, and that should help in your connection speed a little bit. Um, and we are recording today's session, so we will send it out um, hopefully within a week so that you can review it if you need to. Um, and just finally, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors. This webinar is funded by a grant from the Walmart Foundation and administered by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Center for Agricultural and Rural Sustainability, and we are very grateful for their support. So just to get started, before we talk about all of these practices, I want to talk about sustainability and what it means for an agric agricultural practice to be sustainable. So in the 1990 Farm Bill, the USDA actually defined sustainable agriculture, and I won't read you that long definition today, but very generally what it refers to is any agriculture or agricultural practices that promote the long-term viability of a farm. And that could be environmental aspects, economic, or social. And so when we talk about sustainable agricultural practices, we're talking about practices that promote the long-term quality and use of natural resources found on farms and that limit negative environmental impacts that occur as a result of agricultural production systems. So in general, we're talking about using naturally occurring processes to benefit agricultural production to achieve these first two goals. And so examples of this might be using beneficial insects to control pest insects, um, using microbes that are present in the soil that produce compounds that promote plant growth, or using leguminous cover crops that um, fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere into the soil so it's plants available. So these are all processes that are occurring naturally that we can capture these benefits and apply to our agricultural production. So if you think about this in terms of strawberry production in the southeast, and we will be focusing on strawberry production here in the southeast, um, uh, but a lot of these practices can be applied to other production systems and other regions. We just recommend that you talk to your extension agent. But if we think about how strawberries are grown here in the southeast and what limitations we have, um, there are some real challenges. There is a really high susceptibility of soil-borne diseases and pests here in the southeast. A lot of growers have really small plots, which limits their ability to rotate. Um, and these two combined factors have led to a lot of people being reliant on annual fumigation. And so we have this really intensive land use that over time can lead to losses in soil quality, can lead to build up of pests. Um, and so if there's an opportunity to incorporate sustainable practices into our production system that counteract these effects, that can um, help support the long-term sustainability and viability of production systems of strawberries here in the southeast. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hannah Barak to speak about um, sustainable strategies for managing key arthropod pests for strawberries. All right. Uh, so thank you, Amanda. Uh, we're going to spend the next 25 minutes or so talking about uh, arthropod management of key pests of strawberries. And 
just to point out, we talk about arthropod pest management because one of our most important organisms that we deal with is not actually an insect, so we broaden that out a little bit. We'll talk a fair amount about spider mites. That's probably our most common and frequent pest in strawberries. Um, so here are the things that I'm going to cover. So I'm going to focus on some of our key arthropod pests in the southeast. Um, and so one of the caveats I want to point out before I get rolling too far is that, as Amanda noted, production practices, pest complexes, and the tools that you're allowed to use in different parts of the country vary. And so everything we're going to say is going to come with a grain of salt that should be cleared first with your local cooperative extension folks. Um, so in addition to the key arthropod pests that we're most familiar with, get rid of that box. Yeah. I want the pointer. All right. We're going to talk about some strategies to minimize pest presence. We're going to talk about monitoring methods and then the thresholds at which you would take action to prevent damage from some of the key strawberry pests. So I'm going to present a lot of links in this presentation. And just so you don't have to worry about writing all of those down, I have posted all of them at this blog post on the North Carolina Entomology Portal. And so if you write down one web address, this is the one web address to write down. Um, that will have all the subsequent links that are presented throughout my section of the talk, um, as well as any links that are presented elsewhere. I'll incorporate those. That, that post is live now. You should be able to go there right now and see it. Um, in addition to the Entomology Portal, I'm going to frequently reference the North Carolina Strawberry Growers Portal, which is just strawberries.ces.ncsu.edu. Those of you who are in the southeast, if you don't already have a copy of the Southern Region IPM Guide, go download a copy of that right now. Um, that is an annually updated document that uh, all of us who work in strawberries in the southeast contribute to. For those of you in North Carolina, we also have a North Carolina-specific tool that focuses on the allowable resources that can be used here. So that's a shorter and simpler version of what's in the IPM guide. And then finally, for those of you who are outside of our region and you want to run what we talk about by your local cooperative extension folks, this is where you can find who they are and how to get in touch with them. All right, so this timeline just illustrates on order of what is happening when who our key strawberry pests are. So this goes from transplant in the fall all the way through harvest in the late spring and early summer. And just to orient you a little bit to what I'm showing you, I've got icons by each of the pests indicating what they feed on. So if they feed on fruit, there's a little bit, there's a little berry next to them. If they feed on stems, there's a little bundle of sticks next to them. And there's a little leaf next to any of the foliar feeding pests. So these are our key pest organisms that we deal with kind of year in, year out in southeastern strawberries. Um, aphids are potentially a problem in the fall immediately following transplant, and they don't really show up again until right around this time in the spring. The two that I've highlighted in red, spotted wing drosophila and two spotted spider mites, are ones that I'm going to focus on in particular this afternoon. And so they're some of our either most common or most new pest issues that we're dealing with. I will also talk a little bit about aphids. Um, I'm not going to talk about the rest of these in any detail today, clippers, earworms, ligus bugs, thrips, sap beetles, or cutworms. But on the strawberry portal or the entomology portal, you can find lots of additional information about those guys. So just in the interest of time, I'm kind of focusing on our big ones that we can either minimize or use thresholds to manage. And just one relatively straightforward thing that we've done over the last 20 years is going from perennial strawberry production to annual strawberry production. And that shift from a perennial system to an annual system has essentially eliminated all of our soil-borne insect pests um, and some of our plant-borne pests as well, like lemon mites, for example. Um, that also has done dramatic things to reduce things that are called our little root nibbling soil-borne diseases. Um, and they've rendered many aphid vector viruses to be non-pest issues. So this is a perennial strawberry planting in the Pacific Northwest. You can see this row right here. 
has some obvious challenges, and we've got some healthier rows going on. And so that's not something we tend to see as much in annual pesticulture. So that's why today I'm not going to be talking about a whole lot of soil-borne pest issues because we do things from a cultural standpoint that have rendered them no longer our primary concern. So in addition from that shift from perennial production to annual production, there are other strategies that we can use to minimize our arthropod pests. First and foremost, you can get healthy plants. That means plants that are pest-free when you receive them and are ready to go in the system that you're going to grow them in. So that means they've received proper chill hours wherever they're being grown. And so if you're a strawberry grower, you should have a sense of where you're buying your plants from in order to receive the right amount of chill for when you're going to plant them. You want to pick an appropriate planting date for your area. And so this note on here is just a, a blog post from the Strawberry Portal discussing planting dates for the southeastern U.S. and how those might vary between different varieties. And all of those are really important because if you get the plants off to a strong start, you're going to have far fewer pest issues to begin with. Nutrient management can also be a really important arthropod management strategy. Um, in particular, aphids love high nitrogen plants. And so if your plants are over fertilized, you have excess nitrogen present, that's a scenario where we would expect aphids to be more problematic. So your nutrient management strategy should be based on things like soil and tissue testing, which we're going to discuss a little bit later. Your water management is really important, and so proper irrigation strategy. If you have plants that are too wet or plants that are too dry, those stressed plants will also be more attractive to some pests, and I'll show you some data about that specific spider mite. And then your management timing. So when you choose to manage your arthropod pests, it's going to depend on when they're actually causing you measurable damage. And so we're going to use what are called economic thresholds or management thresholds in order to determine when those organisms are actually costing you money. One of the important things that you do in a system in order to maintain sustainability is you tolerate some level of pest pressure. And so you don't necessarily expect to scorch the earth. You expect that there's going to be some population of those pests present below which you're not experiencing any damage, and above which you would take management action. All right, so let's transition into talking about some of our specific pests. So two-sided spider mites are year in, year out, the most frequent and common pest of strawberries throughout the U.S. And so this uh, photograph illustrates a female two-spotted spider mite, one of her eggs next to here, a recently hatched immature spider mite, and a few other females around. And so you're going to have mixed age populations of mites present on leaves. And you can see the cells of the strawberry leaf here to give you a bit of a, a size reference of how small these guys are. You want a minimum 10x hand lens to observe mite presence or absence. So mite populations that develop in the springtime before fruiting have the potential to reduce yield. Populations that develop after fruiting may not necessarily impact yield because the plant at that point has made some decisions about how many fruit it's going to have, how big those fruit are going to be, and oftentimes they're very vigorously growing. And so the impact of a spider mite population is going to be less if you have this fast growing plant. So just to illustrate that infestation timing component. So this is some data from, this is a miticide trial that we did a few years ago. And what we're illustrating here are, in red, the red arrow, when we had to manually infest these plots. So we didn't have natural spider mite populations develop in this location. So where that red arrow indicates is where we took spider mites from our laboratory colony, put them out in the field, and let them develop. And this blue arrow indicates when, on average, our populations exceeded our management threshold and we applied our treatments. You can see all of our treatments are pretty effective. The spaghetti down here, there's a whole lot of treatments represented, except for one, which actually made our spider mite populations worse. This was our pyrethroid insecticide brigade. And so using some insecticides against mites may actually make the problem worse. So this is when our infestation developed, and this is right around when we started picking, was when we started exceeding threshold. It was around the last 
two weeks of April. When we look at yield in those plots, so what this figure is, those same treatments across the bottom, we've got in the red bars and on our left-hand axis, the number of total mite days. So that's just what you saw on that previous figure and just summed up the total of mites. And so you can see, again, here's our brigade with our really high bar. Um, so that's mites over time. And then in our right axis and our blue dots, that's yield. So you can see we don't see a whole lot of difference between yields from our untreated controls, even in our plots that had extremely high mite populations. We didn't see any real difference in yield between any of these guys. And that's because our mite populations didn't develop until the plants had already begun to be harvested. And so they were so vigorous at that point, they'd already put on the fruits that they were going to be putting on, that the mite populations couldn't build up fast enough to significantly impact them. So we care most about mites prior to that period in time. So what affects those mite populations? They can be affected by protected culture. These two figures indicate in red the proportion of the mite population that was reproductively active, and in blue, the proportion of the mite population that was not reproductively active during the winter under high tunnels. So what, what that says is that in high tunnel production, we could have reproductively active mice all winter long. We wouldn't necessarily see that in outside production. We wouldn't expect to see reproductively active mice in the winter. So they can be affected by protected culture. They can be affected by water management. This was some work done by Oscar Liber down at the University of Florida. These are total mite populations across 20 leaves in plants that receive too little water, too much water, or a moderate amount of water. And you can see mite populations were significantly higher both when they received too little and when they received too much water. So water management can impact mites. And that just means stressed plants. Those plants are stressed out by having too much or too little water. And surrounding ground cover can impact mites. If it's extremely dry and you've got a lot of dust, mites, spider mites in particular, get their name because they make little webs. That dust comes up, can attach to the underside of the leaves, and cause what are called refugia. And so they can hide from their natural predators. So if you have a lot of dust in dry weather, that can impact mite population. Other things that can impact mite populations. In the southeastern U.S., we actually have a pathogenic fungus called Neozygites floridania that kills spider mites. But because it's a fungus, it can also be killed by fungicides. So our pathogen management practices could potentially impact our mite populations as well. The fungus is most common in cool, wet conditions. So that's oftentimes why we don't see high mite populations in cool, wet years in the southeast. So how do you determine whether your mite populations are problematic? You should sample on a weekly basis by observing at least 10 mid-tier. And when we say mid-tier, we mean not newly emerged and not old and crunchy leaves under a hand lens. So again, a 10x minimum hand lens. These management thresholds are based on work that was done in California. They seem reasonable for our work in here in the Southeast. So they're probably not exactly perfect for us, but they seem reasonable. Um, so we've done some threshold work on these guys, and they're certainly not too conservative. So our pre-fruiting threshold, this is from February to mid-April. That's our pre-fruiting period. It's five mites per leaflet. Fruiting the plants can handle at least twice that density. And we haven't seen yield reduction at higher than twice that density, but again, this is not a too conservative threshold. So your management options include things like biological control agents. These are some of the species that you might consider using. They're all available commercially. The vendor will have recommendations about the rates that you should release these different predators at and at what point in the infestation you should release them. And then there are chemical control options, and those are going to be detailed in those IPM guides, either the Southern Regional IPM Guide or the North Carolina Ag Chem Manual. All right, let's move on to talking about aphids. Um, so aphids and strawberries have been kind of a hot topic for us here in the southeast the last couple years. And prior to last year, our assumption was that one of these three aphid species was most likely to be present. Potato aphid, strawberry aphid, or green peach aphid. And we can now add at least two more species, this aphid that lacks a common name but is a close relative to strawberry aphid, 
and this yellow rose aphid have both been found on strawberries this past year. This is because we've been paying a lot more attention to aphids and strawberries in light of some virus concerns that we had last year. In fruit production, we typically do not care about aphids. They typically don't exceed damaging thresholds in the southeast in most years. And we really only care about them as a management concern in either nursery operations or perennial productions where they should, they should be aggressively managed because as virus vectors, they can really cause problems in those perennial or nursery situations. So for a fruit grower, we typically don't recommend treating for aphids unless you have populations that are producing sooty mold during the fruiting period and it's contaminating the fruit. But it takes a heck of a lot of aphids to reduce yield in the strawberry plant. And oftentimes what we have is really good native biological controls that will maintain these guys below what would cause damage. And here those guys are. So this is what an aphid that has been parasitized by a parasitic wasp looks like. We call these aphid mummies. They're puffed up, dull, and often light brown as compared to the green, healthy aphids. And right down here where unfortunately the picture cuts off, you can see an aphid mummy that has popped open and now has uh, the wasp inside is exited, and so you've got this little circular thing. These mummies will stick around on the plants after maybe your healthy aphids are no longer present, so you really want to be able to distinguish them and not overestimate what problems you might have there. If we took one of these mummies and flipped it over, this is what we would see. We would see this little yellow guy curled up inside, and then this is that wasp larva pulled out. So again, in typical conditions, they don't exceed damaging numbers. We've got lots of natural biological control agents, and our management threshold is on average 10 aphids per leaflet, and you want to look at the newly emerged leaves for these guys. And you want to use the same sample size, a minimum of 10 leaflets per acre um, that you would for your spider mites. All right, I'm going to transition into my last topic, which is spotted wing drosophila. Um, this is a critter that I spend a lot of time thinking about and looking at. Um, it's an invasive pest that feeds on soft-skinned fruit. The male has spots on its wings. That's where the common name comes from, but the female lacks those spots. So, and not all flies that have spots on their wings are spotted wing drosophila necessarily. The female is the sex that causes the actual damage we worry about. So here she is with an egg hanging out of her ovipositor or egg-laying device. She deposits those eggs just under or on the surface of soft fruit. Larvae develop internally, and that's the problem. Larvae in fruit is generally unacceptable to consumers. Um, they, fruit can appear otherwise undamaged um, until you start examining it really closely and find larvae present. So the risk of damaged fruit being harvested is risk is present. Um, they pupate on or near the fruit, um, and sometimes they pupate outside of the fruit on the surface of the soil. They have a really fast generation time, less than two weeks in most cases, to go to, from adult to adult. And adults can live for greater than a month. So what happens is we have these overlapping generations, which can result in rapid population growth. Our management recommendations for spotted wing drosophila and strawberries are unfortunately preventative. Um, because the risk of having larva-infested fruit is so challenging for growers um, that based on the little that we know about the biology of this critter, um, because it's new in the U.S., we are being conservative in the type of management recommendations that we get. So we have a range of insecticides that are effective against these guys, and those are our primary control tools. For spring fruiting strawberries, we are encouraging growers to monitor for adult flies and to sample their fruit. And again, there's lots of information about adult monitoring and fruit sampling on the resources that are posted online. Um, sanitation is important. Good, thorough harvest and removal of fruit that you're not going to sell from the field. And then in spring fruiting strawberries, we think you can wait to begin your management program until adult flies are detected. And I'll show you some data why we think that. However, for summer-bearing strawberries, day-neutral strawberries, growers should monitor fruit and consider monitoring adult flies, but we know flies are there by the time we're, we're harvesting day-neutral or fall-fruiting strawberries, and so preventative management program 
makes a lot more sense in this scenario. Um, and sanitation is going to be important no matter which of these strategies you're employing. So this is why we think adult monitoring and spring freeing berries makes a little bit more sense. This is the monitoring data from 2012 and 2013. The lines on either figure are the adult flies per trap. The black line from 2012, the green line from 2013. And then the bars are the larvae per berry from fruit samples. In 2013, what you'll notice is that we have fruit infestation occur a week before we caught any flies in a trap. And our fly trap captures were extremely low throughout the entire growing season. In 2013, we switched the bait that we were using in our traps from apple cider vinegar here to a yeast and sugar mixture here. And we caught flies two weeks before any infestation developed. And when infestation developed, it was fairly low. So we actually had several weeks of notice before we had any significant infestation develop. So we think trapping will give you a bit of a warning in those spring fruiting crops, but you've got to use the right trap and you've got to use the right bait. And so again, that information is all available online. Um, so that was a very short overview of minimizing arthropod pests in strawberries. I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. Um, and if you want any of the info that I talked about, um, here's links to find the entomology portal, find us on Facebook, and find me on Twitter. Thank you, Dr. Brock. Now I'm going to pass it over to Michelle Schroeder Marino to talk about soil health. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch up, but I want to step back and talk a little bit about sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability in agriculture, you know, we fundamentally not just think about pests, but also managing the soil. And the management of the soil I'm going to focus on is really thinking about soil health. And I'm going to start talking a little bit about indicators of soil health, and then Amanda will switch over and talk about specific practices. And when I think about strawberry production, soil health is, is really fundamental to think about. Um, because a lot of the practices um, make soil health challenging. And we're eliminating some of um, the beneficials in the soil through fumigation practices. Healthy soils, and not just the biology, but also some of the chemical and physical components of the soil, provide this balance of beneficial organisms, and some of them controlling pests and diseases. Also, some importantly, releasing nutrients, making nutrients more available. In Kind of the flip of that, unhealthy soils, and really thinking about soils perhaps that are compacted, soils lacking the biology, um, lead us down kind of a treadmill of perhaps adding more inputs there, whether it be pesticides to control some of the pests, fertilizer inputs, um, et cetera. So when we think about really strawberry production, we think about healthy soils over the long term, not just within one year or one season, can make plants more vigorous, make plants um, more healthy, and increase yield production. One of the kind of mantras in sustainable agriculture is not just thinking about feeding the plants and providing the nutrients, but also feeding the soil. And so thinking about our practices, whether they be fertilizer practices, whether they be tillage practices, how does that affect the soil um, health this season and over the long term? And so I've got to step back a little bit and provide some kind of, um, I would say, good definitions. And when we talk about soil health, this is a complex um, issue. And one of the better definitions I like that comes from Carlin is really the capacity of the soil to perform ecosystem functions. And not only support plant or our crop growth and yield what we expect, but also support the biological organisms that are there, resist erosion, and reduce negative impacts on either soil or water resources. The latter of these are really now coined into ecosystem services that we think about. So we cannot measure soil health directly. There is not one measurement for it. And so what we use are indicators. And these are more simple measurements, whether they be in the field or in the lab, um, to tell us something about soil health. Are we 
increasing or enhancing soil health or are we going farther away from that? Um, and so indicators are important to be able to use, to be standardized, to be able to be used from farm to farm and over time to really understand how our practices are affecting. The other thing about soil health is just like sustainable agriculture has these three pillars of understanding the effect on the environment, effect on society, effect on the economics, the three pillars of soil health are also understanding indicators for physical structure, biological, and chemical. And I've listed some specific indicators we can measure, whether it be under physical, soil structure, or aggregate stability, the amounts of soil organic matter, chemical, we often already do in many crops to analyze the amount of nutrients in the soil that are available over time, but also understand how those are available on the crop. So it's not just in the soil, but also how that pertains to um, nutrient availability in the crop and the timing that they need it. Biological, it's a lot more difficult or challenging. We know, um, I, I think, sometimes um, more about planets than we do with underfoot. Um, but we tend to look at some key indicators of beneficials and, of course, some key indicators of pests. Dr. Brock went over. When we think about specific soil indicators for strawberry production, this is an area we've been thinking about and working um, for the past five and a half, six years. There are certainly, and they should um, hit the realm of physical, biological, and chemical. Um, and I have a few here, I think, that are somewhat easy and tell us something. Indicators should also change relative to practice. And this is important. How do we know when we do a certain practice, whether it's using a certain type of fertilizer, um, cultivating the soil, even using um, different varieties or over time, how do we know that's going to impact because the indicator should change? That's one of the reasons up here I don't have pH, for example. pH is a very important thing to understand for crop production. However, it's very difficult to change pH, and it doesn't change very readily, and certainly in a short time period relative to our practices. The ones that I have underlined here, I'm going to go over in a bit more detail. Um, one, because soil organic matter is a bit complex and kind of why it's so important. Earthworms, um, and a little bit uh, kind of leads us into a little bit of management practices. And our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Fungi, I know people tend to think bad thoughts when they hear um, fungus, but this is um, beneficial. It's associated with um, many different crops and plant species that can tell us something and tell us about um, perhaps reduction of fertilizers as well because they're able to help plants uptake. There are others, nematode community structure analysis, for example. Um, here in North Carolina, the North Carolina Department um, of Agriculture Consumer Services, this is something, an additional test that can be done. So let's go ahead and start with soil organic matter as an indicator. Soil organic matter itself is a bit complex. When we think of the organic matter in the soil, it's usually split up into these different fractions, namely two. One that is stabilized, or the humic fraction, which has pretty much been broken down, thus that it's not going to be broken down anymore. It looks like soil. Um, versus the active fraction is um, things that perhaps have some visible residues there and is still actively breaking down. There are, of course, a little bit and very fresh residues, or you should could say recently dead things and living things as well. And in a soil, depending upon where you are and depending upon the system, you can have different percentages within the overall soil organic matter. Here in the southeast, our soils, minus a few different soil types, but they're rare, our soils tend to have low overall organic matter. And so it's always um, I think a challenge to us and how to increase organic matter in our cropping system. When we look at testing um, organic matter, many times some of the um, lab analysis may test for the humic fraction, 
but it's the active fraction that we can really see changes over and therefore a better soil indicator. What's important about organic matter is that adding organic matter has huge benefits to soil physical properties, soil chemical properties, and soil biological properties. And when we think about chemical properties, the breakdown of soil organic matter is adding to that nutrient availability, namely nitrogen. What is challenging is to figure out from the organic matter how much of that nitrogen is being released over time. Um, it also can affect soil physical properties. Soil physical properties we mentioned increasing aggregation, for example. Soil organic matter is um, a sponge and can hold um, water. And as well as enhancing the biological activity, soil organic matter is the whole fuel for the whole soil food web below ground. Because that biological activity is enhanced, some of the bacteria, the fungi, are also helping fuse those soil particles together. And because of the biological activity is enhanced organic matter, we can see the reduction of soil-borne diseases like nematodes, fungi, improving pore structure, and overall water sto storage, as well as infiltration. And all of these things can lead to, of course, healthy, more vigorous plants and also yield improvement. Another important indicator or one indicator that's a biological property is earthworms. And earthworms are commonly referred to as ecosystem engineers. And one of the reasons why is because they are changing also the physical structure, potentially the chemical and biological structure or biological indicators of the soil. So earthworms are very diverse. There are over 3,000 species in the world. This is obviously is not a common earthworm that we will see in strawberries, but um, earthworms you can find in pretty much when I'd say spring and summer, there are different um, um, levels as far as what is how to um, get them out of the soil and um, what are available and I'll refer to a resource at the end of this. Earthworms are stimulating microbial activity as they ingest the organic matter in their gut. How they're able to break that down is through um, bacteria. They're mixing, SOM is soil organic matter, bringing it from the top of the soil surface down through the soil profile. Through that increased microbial activity, they're fusing soil particles together, increasing soil aggregation, which can lead to better water infiltration and also better water holding capacity. And all of these can lead to improved crop growth. And these are some of the activities that they're doing. They're bringing soil organic matter from the top of the surface, burrowing down. Not all earthworms do this, but um, some. This burrow itself is a place for roots to grow, as well as water to move down. And then their um, casts or their excreta are actually very rich in not only nutrients, but um, microbial activity called vermicompost. And this um, is being used in many cropping systems. And we'll talk about this in um, strawberry production in a little bit. Mycorrhizal fungi is a little um, less known, so I'd like to talk about this a little bit. And this is actually my area of expertise. Um, mycorrhizal fungi are found, um, they're a mutualistic association. So they are not the type of fungi that make fruiting bodies and the type of great mushrooms and truffles that we like to eat. They do not do that. They live inside the roots and they make these small structures. This is a longitudinal um, section of a root, and then their high feet go out into the soil and it basically increase the absorptive surface area for, new for um, roots to uptake nutrients. And they're formed with over 80% of plant species in the world. In any ecosystem, if you have a plant, minus a few aquatic systems, you're going to find our vascular mycorrhizae. And there's been a lot of different research on their type of benefits, mainly increased nutrient uptake, some resistance to stresses such as drought and root pathogens, namely fungi. They are not breaking down organic matter. They are not like um, other fungi we know. They're getting, they're called obligate symbionts, so they are getting their carbon from the plant host itself. 
and they have these different structures, external hyphae are what's out in the soil, vesicles, um, I'll show you a pitcher and strawberry roots um, are inside the root. Arbuscules um, are looks like little trees, and that's inside the roots in the site of exchange. The fungi is giving the plant nutrients, namely phosphorus. We also know about nitrogen and some micronutrients, and they also make asexual large spores. They're the largest spores in the fungal kingdom, which means that they're not moving around by wind. Um, they can move by water, and um, they are producing it in times of stress. And this is what a strawberry root looks like that's been cleared and stained. So um, it has a blue stain, so we can see the fungal structures. Here are some of the vesicles and the little kind of fuzzy bits. This is under a dissecting scope. Are the arbuscules and um, the hyphae going out into the soil. And you can see it's a much smaller diameter than the root itself. And you can have um, miles and miles of hyphae in the soil. There have been a number of research studies that have looked at mycorrhiza benefits to strawberries in particular. And mainly, um, folks have seen this as a, a bit of a review of the different studies. Um, increased nutrient uptake, and that's a common um, benefit we've seen in many different crops. Increasing soil aggregate and overall soil health indicators, increasing strawberry growth and yield and protection from root pathogens, namely um, some of the different fungal partners. Um, but we also know in strawberry production that fungicides can um, reduce, or in some cases, repeated use of fun fungicides and fumigation practices can reduce or eliminate mycorrhizas altogether in the field. But there are, I think, a, there is an opportunity to add mycorrhizas back into the system either at planting or at plug production, and that's something that we've been doing. Um, and this is a little bit of our results. I think the important thing here is while sometimes you see benefits above ground, you can often, often see benefits below ground from mycorrhizas increase basically root mass. And for those small plants to go out in the field just a little bit bigger can have big impact on growth and yields later on in the season. So mycorrhizas can be inoculated back into the field or plug production for strawberries. There are many different types of commercial inoculants out there. Um, and this is a little bit on resources, and I just want to um, describe them. For some of the things I mentioned about soil health and soil health indicators, there is one lab. U.S., the Cornell Soil Health Lab, where you can send um, soil samples and they will do indicators of soil health. Um, so not just nutrient analysis, um, but also some of the ones that I mentioned, although they don't do mycorrhizal um, colonization of roots. For some of the background on soil biology and organic matter, there's a wonderful publication, um, Soil Biology Primer the Natural Resource and Conservation Service that you can download. Um, and Natural Resource Conservation Service, Service has also a soil quality um, test kit that um, either you can purchase or some, some things you can do yourself. And certainly if you want to know more about mycorrhizas, there is a resource page here. I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. All right, thank you, Michelle. So I'm going to build on what Ms. Michelle just uh, spoke about as far as soil health and talk about sustainable soil management practices. This is actually a photo of our research plots um, this past summer that were planted in cowpea and pearl millet. Um, they were interseeded with this cover crop, and that's one of the uh, cover crops we're working on in our research. So the topics I'm going to cover um, in, in talking about sustainable soil management practices, I'm going to talk really briefly about soil and plant nutrient testing. Uh, Dr. Barak already pointed this out a little bit um, in her talk about ACEs. I'm going to talk about how this relates to um, sustainable soil management practices and how you can be used in combination. Um, I'm going to talk about cover crops, compost, and then how to estimate nitrogen additions from these two um, practices. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up speaking really briefly about beneficial inoculants 
and go over what we found previously in our research in using cover crops, compost, and beneficial inoculants for strawberry production, and then what we're working on currently. So first, just to get started with soil testing, um, I feel like this is like a, a technique that a lot of growers are really familiar with and have at least done once if they're not doing it already uh, every year. Um, but perhaps we can think about it in a new way. So Michelle talked a lot about indicators of soil health. Um, and there are certain tests that you can, uh, can't do, get, or there's certain information you can't get from your soil report, but there is certain information that you can get that can help give you an indicator of soil health. So here in North Carolina, a lot of growers rely on the North Carolina Department of Agriculture Agronomic Services. Uh, we have a great resource there where we can submit soil samples, um, plant tissue samples, and all kinds of different other samples. Um, for growers here, between uh, April and November, soil samples are free. Um, outside of that time period, there is a cost, and for growers who are not in North Carolina, there is a fee. Um, but this is a great resource to just see where your soil is at right now, and then if you implement practices, how your soil changes over time. And again, a lot of these indicators are on a very long time span, so it's not something that you're going to implement today and then see a change in your soil test in the next year. But um, some indicators that you can get from your soil, uh, indicators of soil health that you can get from NCDA are percent humic matter, which is basically just an indicator of the organic matter in your soil that is active, and that will influence how much lime you need to add. Um, the W over V is an indicator of how stainy or how organic your soil is, so if you're adding a lot of organic matter, um, over time that number might change. Um, the CEC is the cation exchange capacity, so that's just a indicator of the nutrient holding capacity, and that will also change with additions of organic matter. Um, but more importantly, soil testing can be really important for fertilizer recommendations. Um, so if you are adding compost and cover crops into your system, over time you could have a buildup of phosphorus, for example, and a soil test would help you be aware of that and prevent um, any toxicity. Uh, we do recommend that if you're going to be doing co compost that you soil sample annually, um, other producers may only need to soil sample by annually. So in order to get really good data with your soil test, it's important um, that you have a good sampling technique. The quality of your results will be based on your sampling technique. Uh, we recommend sampling in late spring or early summer so that you have enough time before that strawberry crop actually goes into the ground to make any changes. Uh, we recommend collecting 15 to 20 soil cores over a single management area. So if you have uh, multiple different varieties or you're managing different areas of your farm in different ways, you'll need to sample those separately. And then collecting samples at 6 to 8 inches deep. Um, if you randomly collect all your samples over your field and just want to know what is going on in your field, that's a predictive test. If you have a certain area of your field where you are having a recurring problem, you can do a diagnostic test and only sample in that area. Um, but one thing you might notice about these sampling techniques is that it doesn't give you a really good idea of nitrogen. And the way that we can figure out what's going on with soil nitrogen is to use um, predictive plant tissue testing. And this is something that Dr. Barak uh, brought up with her aphid discussion. Um, and this is basically just going through your field and collecting the petioles and leaflets from 20 to 25 different plants. Um, and the nitrate that is present in the petioles relates directly to the soil nitrate that is available. Um, and so this can be really important if, you, again, you're adding compost and cover crops and using those for nitrogen additions into your system. Um, this is a good way to monitor exactly how much active nitrate is, left, is in your field. Uh, we recommend starting this in March. And again, um, you want to make sure that you're sampling the correct way. So you don't want to sample the oldest leaves and you don't want to sample the newest leaves. You want to sample the most recently mature leaves. So in this picture, with the yellow star is pointing to a recently mature leaf. Generally, we're talking about those leaves being three to five leaves back um, from the growing point. So in order to do this, you would go through, collect your 20 to 25 leaves, and you would separate the leaflets from the petiole and, sub and submit both the leaflets and the petioles together. So to get started talking about cover crops, um, just to review, cover crops are a crop that you grow uh, or plant that you're not going to harvest and sell in any way. You're planting it for another reason. Um, for instance, your goal might be to grow your own nitrogen. You might want to add more organic residue. You might want to prevent erosion. Um, certain cover crops can prevent evaporative water loss by covering the soil during the summer. Um, 
a lot of cover crops have really deep rooting systems, so they can relieve soil compaction problems, and they can also uh, contribute to weed suppression. So depending on your farm and what your uh, needs are, this will um, help you determine what type of cover crop you want to plant. So I'm thinking about how to inco incorporate cover crops into strawberry production here in the southeast. We need to be aware that we have a very short window in which we can incorporate cover crops. Um, and that is between uh, May and August, or the very end of May when we get done harvesting, um, to plant these cover crops, get a lot of biomass, a lot of nitrogen um, growth going, and then we're going to have to um, mow the cover crop and incorporate it into the soil. And there's two things to think about this. Um, First of all, we want to produce as much biomass as we can, so we want to make sure that we have a really good seeding technique so that um, the plants and cover crops come up well. And then we are going to have to make sure that we have a good way to mow and incorporate that biomass at the end. Because if we are making raising beds at the end of August or beginning of September, we want to make sure that all that biomass is broken down really well so it doesn't get hung up in your bed layer or it doesn't poke through the plastic, right? And so a couple of ways that we figured out to do this are to use enhanced seeding rates. And enhanced seeding rates um, accomplish two goals. First of all, you get a lot of coverage really quickly because there's a lot of plants out there. And then there's a lot of competition between those plants. So the plants don't grow as thick. The stems aren't as thick, so they will break down more quickly. Um, if you use this type of technique, it is important to tissue sample your cover crop in order to assess um, very specifically how much nitrogen or how much um, of different nutrients you're adding into the soil, and you can submit this as a waste analysis. Um, for your farm, there are going to be some specific needs. If you want to do cover crops, you're going to have to think about some machinery that you will need in order to feed your cover crop, um, what machinery will be needed in order to mow it and incorporate it. Um, and if you're going to need to use an interseeding where you're using two different cover crops, the ability to possibly seed both of those at the same time, or seed one and then follow with a different. So just briefly, I wanted to go over um, some different types of cover crops that we have worked on here in the southeast that are appropriate for the summer. Um, I split them out into legumes and grasses. Um, the combination that we have found the best in our research is cowpea and cold millet. Um, and they are both very drought tolerant and adapted for soils. Um, we also have the enhanced seeding rate recommendations. Uh, so for cowpea, you would want about 100 to 130. For a curl millet, 30 to 40, but if you're mixing those together, you want to drop down the seeding rate for the grass. So generally, we've been going with a mixture of around 100 pounds of cowpea with around 20 pounds of curl millet. Um, some of the other uh, cover crops that we've looked at are soybeans. Um, they have moderate weed suppression. They produce more biomass than cowpea, um, but they do need more water. So something to consider based on your conditions. Uh, velvet bean is another option. It's very heat tolerant um, and it's resistant to nematodes. Um, as far as grasses and comparing buckwheat and Sudan, Sudan will produce a ton of biomass um, and so much so that you might need to actually mow it twice, whereas buckwheat is a crop that is much shorter um, and so it will produce biomass in a shorter time frame if you, um, for instance, have a shorter window to do your cover crop. There is another resource online and we will link that at the very end and it's the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, the SARE Network has a Managing Cover Crops Profitably, um, and that's a free resource online that might be good to go and look at, and we'll outline um, the specifics of each of these crops a little bit more. So then talking about compost. Compost is very similar in what goals it can achieve um, when you compare it to cover crops. The only difference being that it won't have as much um, erosion control as a cover crop, or just covering the soil. Um, but it does provide a lot of nutrients. Um, the nitrogen can be a lot more readily available in compost depending on the feedstock or depending on what it's made out of. Um, it also provides a lot of micronutrients. It can incorporate organic matter into the soil. It can contribute to improved aggregate stability so your aggregates will hold together better. Um, also contributes to soil microbial activity and to water infiltration and holding capacity. Um, something to consider is are there any locally available sources, and this may be a limitation for some growers who aren't able to identify a good local source, um, but if a grower is able to make compost on farm, that would contribute to on-farm nutrient cycling. Um, compost has also been investigated as an alternative to fumigation, but at this point it has not been found to be as effective. So when we think about when we can incorporate compost into the strawberry production cycle, there's really two windows. One of those is in June, and that is to 
to apply compost just prior to seeding cover crops. Um, and the other alternate alternative is to apply it in August just prior to planting and prior to raising beds. Um, the value in applying it in June is that some of those nutrients that are applied in the comp by, applied by the compost will be taken up by the cover crop and then returned to the soil again in August. Um, if you apply compost in August just prior to planting, you do need to be aware of what sort of salts are present in the compost. Um, for instance, a lot of compost made out of manure um, might be high in salt and could burn your plants. So it's really important um, to get your material tested um, and to also test your soil because if you're applying compost, um, there is a potential to apply too much phosphorus over time if you're continually incorporating compost every year. Um, and depending on the feedstock, again, depending on what your compost is made out of, you could also be applying heavy metals. So if you're using compost, please do make sure that you're soil testing regularly. Uh, we do recommend incorporating compost um, after its application so that you retain more of those nutrients in the soil. So in thinking about these two um, techniques, both compost and cover crops, they are very often used to incorporate nitrogen into the soil. So I want to go over very briefly how we um, calculate nitrogen additions from these two uh, management practices. If you actually submit your compost and your cover crop tissue to NCDA or to another uh, testing facility, they can sometimes give you recommendations on how much nitrogen or how much of a certain nutrient will be available to the next crop. But um, if you want to think about it in a different way, this is generally how it is um, calculated. And one of the really important things to remember when you're making these calculations is that the rate of nitrogen and the rate at which you're applying both have to be in wet weights or in dry weights. So if, for instance, you have your compost tested and they give you back information about your compost being 2% nitrogen on a dry weight and you apply six tons of compost on a wet weight, you will underapply the nitrogen. Whereas if the reverse, if you apply, you think your compost is 2% nitrogen on a wet weight and you apply the compost on six tons of acre on a dry weight, you will be way over applying nitrogen. So it's really important to remember that the units match up, that um, both are in dry weights or both are in wet weights. So here in the first example for compost in the blue box, um, let's assume that our compost was 2% nitrogen and we applied it at a rate of 6 tons per acre. That is 0 0.02 um, times 12,000 pounds, which is our 6 tons of compost, which means we applied 240 pounds of nitrogen. And it's important to remember that that 240 number is not the total amount of nitrogen that will ever be plant available and it's not the amount of nitrogen that, that will be plant available all at one time. It's going to be very slowly released over time. Um, and that's something that we have to figure out um, as far as how that nitrogen is being released in the soil and it will be dependent on what microbes you have present in the soil. It will depend on temperature and climate. And so a very, very conservative estimate might be that 20% of it will be available to the first crop. And that's really an estimate that's quite low. Um, most estimates range from 40 to 70%. But for this scenario, let's say that 20% is available to the first crop, which would be our strawberry crop. So we're applying 48 pounds of nitrogen per acre in compost. Um, very similarly with cover crops, um, if we assume that we have a cowpea cover crop and the biomass or the tissue for this cover crop is 3% nitrogen and we know that we have 3,126 pounds of dry biomass and the way to uh, set your biomass would be to go out and mark off a one foot square um, or a one meter square area, um, remove the biomass from that area and waste. You can figure out how much um, biomass you apply per acre by extrapolating. But in this scenario, if we take 3% times the 3,126 pounds, we applied 93.78 or pounds of total nitrogen. And again, um, not all of that nitrogen will be, ever be plant available, not all of it is available immediately. Um, and if our estimate, um, there is some research that's been done that the estimate is generally around 50% is available to the first crop for cover crops. We've applied 46.89 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and if you remember what the recommendation here in North Carolina for about the amount of nitrogen to apply in the season, it's 120 pounds. And so just with compost and cover crops alone, if this was our farm, we've almost applied 100 pounds of nitrogen. So this is why it's really important to continue to do nutrient testing um, of your strawberry plant tissue and soil testing so that you know how, what your fertilizer, fertilizer recommendation really should be. Um, because in this scenario, there's really only about 20 pounds of nitrogen that will need to be applied in the spring. Um, so this is something really important if you're going to incorporate these things that you don't want to be over applying nitrogen and leading to problems, not only um, possible toxicities, but as Dr. Brock pointed out, to spiking aphid population. 
So the last topic I'm going to talk about is beneficial inoculants. And again, the idea behind this is just to promote soil microbial diversity. Um, and the idea is to use vermicompost and arbustro mycorrhizal fungi, which um, Dr. Shorter Moreno talked about, and incorporate those into the plug production. So incorporating these two inoculants into your plug media, and by doing that, the plug is then established with these microbes, and when you transplant it out into the field, you're basically inoculating your field with these microorganisms. Um, and again, this is something that we've seen that it does increase um, root biomass, it does in increase shoot biomass as well, and I will talk about some of the effects that we've seen with yield here in a second. Um, but it's something that we're continuing to investigate, um, and we also have a video online that I will link to at the very end that goes into a little bit more specifics about how we do this process. So in talking about our research, we've actually had two prior studies um, before the one that we're doing now about using cover crops and compost for, for strawberry production. In 2007 to 2009, um, we had two seasons of strawberry production, and in the first year, we planted Chandler, and in the second year, Camarosa. This was an organic study, so there was no fumigation going on. Um, and the study was focused on using cover crops and two different types of mycorrhizal inoculum. So in this study, we had eight different summer cover crops that included Sudan grass, curl millet, soybean, velvet bean, and the different combinations of those. And then we had two different kinds of mycorrhizal inoculum that we were testing. We were testing natives, so the type of fungi that are native to the soil, and then a commercial mycorrhizal inoculum that could be bought. Um, and we found out some interesting results from this. And using cover crops, we found that the cover crops had a great ability to suppress weeds, um, and that they greatly enhanced soil organic matter, but there was no short-term effect on yield. And again, when we're talking about a lot of these sustainable practices, the focus is on long term. So in two years, we weren't able to see an effect on yield, but in a longer term span, we're not sure what effect that might have. Um, in addition, in comparing the two different types of inoculum, we saw no difference. So the native and commercial were equal. Uh, the commercial mycorrhizal inoculum is probably more acceptable to most growers. And then in our second study, we built off of this first study, but we're interested in how we could perhaps increase the amount of biomass that cover crops were producing, so we um, combined cover crops with compost applications there in June. Um, in this study, we had six cover crops, uh, curl millet, soybean, cow pea, and mixtures, and then we still had two inoculants. This time, we used um, mycorrhizae and mycorrhizae plus vermicompost, and we had two really interesting results from this study. Um, the first being that uh, cover crops increased soil nitrogen throughout the growing season. So if you look at this graph, the yellow line at the very bottom is our control treatment. So that was, that, that was plots that received no cover crop and no compost whatsoever. All of the other lines above that are all of the treatments that did get some combination of cover crop and compost. And so even though we're measuring soil nitrogen up to 172 days after planting during peak flowering, and then again at 200 days after um, planting during peak fruiting, there's still more active soil nitrogen in these plots that receive the cover crops um, and compost. And this is despite the fact that in these cover crop plots, we reduced the amount of nitrogen we applied, or the nitrogen fertilizer that we applied, by 93%. So um, this is a really interesting um, result in showing that there is more soil, active soil nitrogen in these systems. Um, despite this, there was no significant difference. There was no positive or negative effect on yields from cover crops. However, when we looked at the um, differences in the two inoculants and using our vestrial mycorrhizal fungi alone and our vestrial mycorrhizal fungi and vermicompost together. Vermicompost and the fungi inoculation together increased strawberry plant growth and yield. And so using all of this information that we have, we are now um, building on this even further because these first two studies were both organic studies and now we're interested in knowing how all these practices fare in community systems. So we have um, a combination of different treatments, including compost, compost and cover crops, um, beneficial inoculants alone, and then some lucky plots get all three. They do compost, cover crops, and beneficial inoculants. And these are applied um, in a system that has been fumigated and in a system that has not been fumigated in order that um, we can make better recommendations to growers who are fumigating about what practices are most appropriate for them and also make recommendations to growers who are not fumigating about what practices are most valuable in their system. Um, this research is taking place at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems down in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, this is our first year of the study, and so we'll be harvesting here in a few weeks. Um, and then we will plant again next year, and in the 2014-2015 season, we are looking to do 
some on-farm research, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, please keep us in mind. Um, and with that, I will put up our slide that has all of the extra resources. Um, here's the first uh, website that's the Strawberry Portal that a lot of people have mentioned. Um, a few other things that I do want to point out that are different that weren't on the previous slides. Here's the cover crop and fertilizer calculator from Oregon State. Um, that can be valuable if you um, soil test and test your compost and cover crops and you can plug in numbers into that and that will help you calculate your nitrogen additions. Um, also here is the video um, that I was talking about before about the use of beneficial soil inoculants. Um, and then finally this is our Facebook page and you can go and like us there if you want to stay up to date on our upcoming institution publication. And I saw that we are having, uh, we have about two questions, I think, both for Dr. Barak, if you'd like to address those very quickly. All right, uh, so the first question that came in was, um, why are we trying to control fungus on spider mites? We're not, actually. Um, that's a side effect of pathogen management activities. And so I'll zoom back to that slide really quick and just unpack that briefly. So this pathogenic fungus is beneficial. We can't really augment it. It's not a commercializable fungus that we can release out there. It naturally occurs, um, but it can be impacted by pathogen management strategies that would be targeting fungal pathogens of strawberries, so things like botrytis um, and other fungal pathogens, so things that you might use to control them, and even some herbicides can negatively impact that particular fungus. Um, so that's another good reason to time your pathogen management strategies to only the points in time you need to manage those pathogens rather than following the management schedule, which is often what can be recommended in the absence of having that biological information. Um, the next question that came in was dealing with uh, ladybug larvae feeding on strawberries. And I read this a little bit in the chat box. Um, and so I would, I would ask that person, where are you from? Who asked about ladybugs and strawberries? Because I have a suspicion, but it's going to kind of depend on, on where you're at. <laughs> yeah. So I'll turn it over to so that person who asked about larvae and strawberries in Taylorsville, North Carolina. Okay. Um, so it's possible that what you might be dealing with is our multicolored Asian lady beetle. That's a non native species of Asian of lady beetle. Um, and they have been documented in some systems when their populations get really high to be possibly feeding on fruit. But typically, they're not going to go to fruit as the first thing that causes the damage. So oftentimes, that's fruit that was initially compromised by something else. And then the lady beetle adults or larvae might take advantage of that initial damage. Um, and that's mostly been documented in uh, grapes um, with this one specific non-native species of lady beetle. Um, it's not something that our native, native lady beetles would do, and it's not something that we would expect to happen to sound undamaged fruit. Um, so it's fruit that would likely have been compromised by something else first, maybe not readily obviously. Um, but we wouldn't expect that the ladybugs would be doing anything as a primary source of damage. So I think we have a couple of questions about fertility management. Turn it over to Dr. Shreda Moreno. Thank you. Um, so the question was, if you are using compost and cover crops, and in particularly for nitrogen additions, and, and you're getting a good amount of it, what can you supplement um, to recommend the extra 20 pounds or more of nitrogen for the crops. And really, the first you're um, thinking about that spring fertility in, in the drip irrigation system. Because all of these things are happening, the other nitrogen additions are happening prior. So we call that pre-plant fertilizers. Um, and so I guess the answer depends if you are certified organic or not. If you're not certified organic um, and still aiming for sustainability, um, I think select use of um, synthetic fertilizers is economic and select being you're not going over more than that's needed. 
the main one um, is used as calcium nitrate. Um, you can also use a limited amount of sodium nitrate in organic. Organic, this is one of the biggest challenges. Certified organic fertilizers for drip irrigation. There's not a lot on the market, and the ones that are are very expensive. So actually looking at how we can get more nitrogen out of those organic inputs is very important for the reduction of costs um, in particular, even for the organic inputs. There is some fish emulsions that can be used. My only feeling about it is um, to make sure that those don't plug the emitters, um, which can be a problem in, in some circumstances. Um, there are some or organic products out there. I can't really recommend some, but in the West Coast there is a lot, but the problem with the organic fertilizer amendments is they're low in fertility. I think some of the larger ones are maybe be, maybe 444 or 555, which means you've got to buy a lot more. Um, so I, I think some of the organic amendments are fine and a reduced amount of sodium nitrate we've, we've used before quite readily. All right, thank you for the question. Uh, there's just a few points that I want to point out before we leave. Um, again, the recorded version we will try and send out here in the next week. Um, as soon as you exit the webinar, you will be referred to a survey online. Um, and we greatly appreciate your feedback there to know what we did good and what we can do better uh, next time. So please take a few minutes to go fill out that survey. There's only about six questions. Um, so thank you so much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future.